Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, my name's Jim. And it looks like I'll be your new lead pastor. We'll soak that up. <laughs> the Lord is good. It's been a long haul. Um, it's not as long a haul as it could have been to find the lead pastor. Uh, but I'm just really looking forward to what God's going to do with the body here at Crossroads in Grant's Pass because I believe that this group of believers can radically change this community by living for Jesus. And as we discover what that means, the, the more we get in contact with the world, the more we're going to have an influence to draw them to himself. And so, um, the last week in September, I'll be kind of casting a vision. I'll be, I'll be helping us set sail to where I think we need to be going, where the elders believe we need to be going as a church. So be praying for that date specifically, that message, that we would hear the Lord's voice in preparation and be willing to move that way. Will you do that with me? Amen. All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> please turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. We are in the third chapter of John. We're, we are going to continue going through this book uh, just because uh, I, I got named the new lead pastor doesn't mean we're going to stop doing what we've already been doing. And that's getting in the Word day after day, week after week, finding out what God has for us. Because, you know, none of this takes God by surprise. Uh, God knew we were going to be in this book, and God knew that we needed this book and the message that's here uh, to, to build us up, to encourage us, to strengthen us, and to live like the lights that we're intended to be in this community and in this world. So we're here in 1 John chapter 3. Uh, hopefully you have your Bibles there. If you don't have a Bible, there is one in the, uh, the little shelf in the bottom of the seat in front of you, hopefully. There's two or three of them in each row. And uh, I'd encourage you to open up to uh, 1 John chapter 3. Before we get into the Word, this is what I'd like to do. We, we have a um, community that's in distress. With the Rum Creek fire that's going on, uh, Bill Judy couldn't even be here today because his house is in jeopardy. They're having to wait to see what's going to happen with it. And there's many, many others in our community that are in that same uh, predicament. We need to be praying for them, okay? We're going to do that, but we're also going to pray because this is a big week for uh, many of our younger uh, <clears throat> kids, okay? School starting. And this is a major event in their life, not only in theirs, but the teachers and all, everybody that's associated with school. So we just need to be lifting them up. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are a God that we can go to uh, in time of need, uh, Lord, to gain strength, to gain wisdom, to gain insight in how we are to live, and we beseech you, Lord, right now, on behalf of those who are... Um, uh, surrounded by this uh, fire in Rum Creek. Lord, we, we know that this is intimidating. We've been uh, enduring these things uh, season after season here in Southern Oregon for years. And Lord, here it is on our doorstep again. And we would pray, Lord, for protection. For those who are fighting the fire, who are working with it, would you pr protect them? Keep them safe. Lord, as we've already had some people uh, killed and injured uh, because of uh, the danger in it, uh, we would pray that you would protect these people. Lord, for the, the homes and property uh, of the people that are in the fire's path, Lord, we would pray for protection from that, that you would just uh, stop those flames from consuming uh, valuable property and, and people's uh, livelihoods and, and, and their their homes in which they live. Lord, we also pray that you would protect the lives of these people who are in the way. Um, let them use wisdom in getting out in time. Let them uh, be able to get out as is necessary. But also, Lord, we would pray that you would use this 
to draw people to yourself. That uh, the community at large, uh, specifically the Christian community, would come alongside these people and, and help and nurture and care for them. Father, we also look forward to this next week when school starts. And there are so many that are impacted by this, uh, from the very young to uh, the, uh, the teachers and administrators. Father, I pray for the students that you would cause this year to be a year of learning, of encouragement, of seeing success in their learning. But uh, Lord, we would pray that uh, the things that have uh, been so prevalent these last couple of years with the distance learning and, and uh, the Chromebooks and all of that stuff, Lord, they just wouldn't have to do this year. Lord, that they would just be able to be in the classroom learning uh, at their level and that uh, you would help the students catch up where they've uh, lacked in the past. Lord, I pray that you would put your blessing on the teachers, that they would uh, be able to get their work done and uh, teach through the curriculum. Lord, we pray that uh, our classrooms would be a safe environment for these kids. We pray that the truth would be taught. Lord, we pray that agendas would be laid aside and there would be some good reading and writing and arithmetic being done. Father, we pray for the administrators. Give them wisdom and insight as they deal with all kinds of issues. Uh, those who are working in the lunch rooms, those janitors and custodians, uh, the maintenance people, Lord, that you would just bless them. Give them wisdom. Give them protection. Let this be a year where they can just enjoy serving. And so, Lord, we give this to you and ask you to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in 1 John, chapter 3. We're going to just cover three verses today, but this really is a continuation of thought. Verse 1, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. This passage right now that we're going to study I tell you what, it's got the gospel all through it. And for some of us, it's going to be like, oh, coming back home. And it is. It is coming back home. And we need to be coming back home to the foundations of the faith constantly and consistently. And in that, we will find hope. We will find encouragement. We will find challenge. When we have been distressed, when we have been uh, bogged down by the world's issues, the, the frustrations, if we come back to this passage and we contemplate it and we think about it, we consider it, we're going to be encouraged. So once again, we're going to go to the Lord for his enlightenment. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bring your spirit to bear these words into our hearts, on our hearts, in our minds, that you would illuminate us to see the beauty of these words. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's uh, no question, I, I don't think with any of us, that, that um, love is a key component to the human existence. I mean, we're swayed by this whole concept of love all throughout our, our um, culture. Uh, we're influenced, we're driven by love. It's a basic human need to be loved and to show love. Would you agree with me on that one? Yeah, that's, that's pervasive. And if one just takes a look, a, a, just a, a cursory look at our culture, we can see that to be true. Especially if you uh, look at pop music. Over the past 70 years... Uh, we see love as a major theme, and we see how the world responds to it, 
and our culture sees love and their, its impact on them. I did a, a Google search and I typed, in, <clears throat> I typed in song titles that have the word love in it. Oh, there were lists. There was one list that had oh, like uh, 1,700 titles. It was crazy. Um, and so what I, I want to do is I, I just want you to listen to some of these titles and see if there's a, a clue as to how the world considers love. The world. Not we as Christians, but the world. Some of these you'll recognize, and some of them you won't. Depends on maybe age and uh, your preference. And some of these I might even sing just a little bit. <clears throat> what is love? All you need is love. What the world needs now is love. Put a little love in your heart. The power of love. Can't help falling in love. I will always love you. I honestly love you. Can you feel the love tonight? My Endless love. Where did our love go? I can't make you love me. Can't buy me love. I'll never fall in love again. A world without love. Love is a battlefield. Tainted love. Love hurts. Love stinks. What's love got to do with it? Bye-bye, love. <laughs> so, <laughs> mankind's greatest need is to receive and to give love. To give, receive the love from God is our greatest need. And if that's done outside of a relationship with God, we're likely to become disappointed we're likely to become disillusioned, and we know that human love will fail. But when we're correctly related to the one who created us, we will know and experience love as it should be, and that love does not fail. So in today's text, what we're going to see is that, that mankind has been invited to become children of God. So our main point our main point is that as we consider the many implications of what God's love has done in us and for us, our core motivations, passions, and behaviors will be radically altered. That's what we're going to look at today. So here we are, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to look at three main points here. The first point, God's love should be continually contemplated. What does that mean? That means that we need to be thinking about it all the time. If we are, we're going to get things in the right perspective. Our challenge is that we don't think about God's love all the time. And I'm going to encourage you guys, take notes, because you're going to want to look at this through the week and contemplate these concepts that we need to contemplate, think about, consider, ponder God's love consistently. So <clears throat> looking at the first verse here in chapter 3, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. See how great a love. Now the King James Version says, behold, what manner of love? Behold. That's not a word we use very often. When was the last time you actually used that in regular conversation? We don't use that word, but it's a great word. It's like, wow, check this out. Think about this. Put this in front of your eyes and just consider it. Sit down with the idea, the thought of God's love. It's multifaceted, and we can never plumb the depths of it. 105 years ago, 1917, Frederick Lehman wrote a song called The Love of God, a hymn. And in the third verse, poetic, well put together, we read these words, could we with ink 
the oceans fill, and where skies of parchment made, where every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, the love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints' and angels' songs. How deep. If you're going to quote a modern song, the Bee Gees, how deep is your love? but we're talking about God's love. And there ain't no way to get to the depth of it, to understand it. It is something that God has put there so that we would wonder at it for all eternity. So we, we contemplate the majestic quality of it, the wonder of it, but also it's, we uh, contemplate it for its incomparable quality. It's incomparable quality. It's unique. It says, how great a love the Father has bestowed on this. Uh, King James again, behold, what manner of love. That, That term there means that it is something that is completely other than our human experience of love. God's love is very different. It is not of human origin, and literally, it speaks of something foreign. When God poured his love out on us, it was very different. The next point is that it's of the highest quality. Love is, God's love is of the highest quality. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. John 15, 13. These words of Jesus on the night in which he was going to be betrayed says to his disciples there in the upper room, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Here's the pinnacle of love, he's saying, that we lay down our lives. And Jesus himself laid down his life for his friends, the disciples he was talking to. But that extends to us down the road. It's of the highest quality. There's no greater love, but there's also that love that he's he's pointing to here that is to the point of death. And we just studied this in uh, Philippians chapter 2. Verse 8, and being found in the appearance of a man, as a man, talking of Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Now, we have to consider that staircase down. That he was the exalted God. He is the exalted God in an exalted position in heaven for all eternity past. And he became obedient to the Father's will, came down, became a baby, born in a cradle, or born in a main, born in a stable, placed in a manger. We have a hard time even understanding that. Because you know what? We live in this human existence. We were born in this human existence. But he humbled himself to the point of becoming a human. That's like us humbling ourselves to the point of being a maggot. Oh, he said that in church? Yeah. Yeah. To the point of a maggot. That's humbling ourselves. But he became God, or he was God, became a man, and became a worm. That's the point. And to the point of death. 
being slain, being executed as a common criminal. That's love. And he did it for you. He did it for you. He did it for me. And it was his choice to do that. And this love that we think about, this love that we, we contemplate, is a gift. The word here, bestowed. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. That is actually the term for a gift. He's given it to us. Uh, it's a one-sided type of giving. It, we didn't give anything back, you know. Uh, we don't have anything to offer God back. We really don't. It's like he's giving us all the riches of heaven. And me, I got a popsicle stick. Uh, here. It, it, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. But it's one-sided giving that he lavished his love upon us. And it's also a permanent possession. It's inseparable. It is always toward us. Look at Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 35. I have it here on the screen. Uh, selected verses 35, 38, and 39. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or anything else you could con conceive of that might think that God is not there, and he does not love me anymore. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, is that something to celebrate? Nothing's going to separate us from the love of God. It is bestowed upon us. And we worry about things. Well, where was God on that one? I have financial issues. I wrecked my car. My back hurts. I've got medical issues. My spouse left me. My spouse died. My kids are running amok. Where is God? He loves you. He loves you completely. He loves you thoroughly. And there's nothing you could do or not do to make him love you less. Can you see how if we are contemplating these concepts consistently changes the whole tenor of life, the whole way we approach life? <clears throat> so we see that we should be contemplating God's love for its wonder, for its incomparable quality. It's the highest of qualities and for its vast reach. Now, we're very familiar with this verse, John 3, 16. This is to the world, for God so loved the world. Now, we're not talking about the planet. We're not talking about what John was talking about in chapter 2, where he says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. That's the world system that is diametrically opposed to anything that, that uh, even reeks or, or smells or uh, has a flavor of God being Lord. This is the world of people. This is the world of people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Oh, we've known that verse, many of us, for many, many years. But that's one to hang our hats on. That's one to pin our hopes on. That God loves the world. And I am part of that. But not only that, it, 
the reach, the vast reach, comes to us individually. In Romans 5.8, it's, well, in the verse here, it says, he has bestowed on us, on us, he has given this gift. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still running away from God, ignoring God, didn't care a thing about him, Christ died for us. Demonstrating his love toward us. What a beautiful concept. It's to us individually. And then we need to contemplate God's love for its focus. Its focus. God's love made us his children. It says here in, in uh, the middle of verse 3 that we would be called children of God. That we would be called children of God. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, and we're familiar with this verse, many of us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. He's a new creature. She is a new creature. You are a new creature if you are in Christ. If you accept him, believe him, receive him, you're new. You're radically new. And that's where it starts. But not only that, not only are we a new creature, it is exclusive. It is to those who receive Christ. John 1.12. We've got to remember this. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called children of God, or to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Who are the children of God? Those who receive him. Receive him. Uh, the world's going to tell you we're all children of God. You know, everybody. It doesn't matter. We're all paths lead to heaven, right? No. No. It's exclusive. Oh, Jim. You're so narrow-minded. I'm not narrow-minded. I'd love it if everyone went to heaven. But it's what the Word of God says. That's what I have to base this on. And so what do I say here? It is exclusive. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And because he said that, I have to hang my head on my hat on that one. I have to base my belief on that because that's what Jesus said. It is exclusive. But you know the beautiful thing? People say, oh, that's so narrow. Yeah, no, he provided a way out. We were all headed to hell. But he provided that escape. And that's the beautiful thing. That's God's love. He wasn't just going to let us just go straight to hell and spend eternity away from him. What a beautiful thing. God's love. And we're adopted. This love brings an adoption. Ephesians 1, cha uh, chapter 1, verse 5. He, Jesus, predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus. Or God predestined us uh, to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. So we're adopted. It's his choice. Nobody made God do this. He wanted to. What a beautiful thing. But we see here at the end of verse um, 3, or verse 1, for this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not, John 1 says. And so because we're his children, they don't recognize us. They don't understand. They have no concept. And we, gotta under we have to understand this concept. 
that when we share the gospel, there are people that just plain don't get it. They don't understand it. And it is a work of God's spirit to unveil their eyes. <clears throat> so we see that God's love should be continually contemplated, thought about. But here in verse 2, we're going to see that God's love changes his children. Changes his children. Look at verse 2 here. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Wow. We are God's children. Not only are we God's children, we are fully God's children. Uh, fully, it says, it says right here, Beloved, now we are children of God. It's not like in the future we're going to be God's children. It is right here, right now, as we have received him, we are God's children. And this is just like a baby. Spiritually, right now in this form, we're just kind of like a, a baby, a young toddler, maybe uh, 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 under 10 sit there and say, I, I've been a Christian for 50 years. We have, well, bear, bear with me. Uh, so we are not what we're going to be. We're not what we were, but we're in this growth process of life. And we've got to understand, we ain't there yet. We're not all we're going to be. And, you know, uh, as a baby grows, so we're growing spiritually. And if you want to put it this way, when we come to know the Lord, he gives us that new birth, we gain God's spiritual DNA within us, his spiritual DNA. Now, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, I had to practice that word. I'm not going to say it again. Um, <laughs> DNA, that'll work. It's a polymer that uh, within cells that carries the genetic instructions for the development, functioning, growth, and reproduction of all known or organisms. Okay, again, the development, functioning, growth, reproduction. Those are the genetic instructions that are in DNA. And they're in most of our cells. God's spiritual DNA is within us when we become his children. Now, that needs to grow. Uh, when you were born, were you walking? No. No. You had to develop. You had to grow so you could actually carry yourself. And then you could take steps. And they were a little wobbly, but you could take the steps. And then soon you're running. And yes, you may fall down, skin your nose, but you get back up again. And you grow. And then you learn to ride a bike. And then you could do all kinds of sports. And then you eventually wind up uh, in, a, in a walker. Uh, I... See, some illustrations break down. <clears throat> but we have this spiritual DNA in us that as we grow, we will behave, look like, sound like, act like our spiritual father, our heavenly father. Just like me. My father passed away several years ago. I haven't seen him in years, but you know what? I'm still acting like him. I still do the things. I make noises that he used to make, and I'm wondering, why am I doing that? Well, because my dad did it. You know, when you bend down, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. But I, I kind of look like him. I have the nose. Um, you know, it's just, and we're the same way. That's that DNA. That's that, 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 the. Uh, Connection we have with, with our parents, same thing. 
God's put his DNA in us so that we will progressively grow into all the maturity of Christ, of who Christ is, that we would develop that way so that the way Jesus responds to things, we respond. That the words that he speaks, we're going to be speaking and acting out. That's the maturity process. We call that sanctification here in this life. Okay, being made more holy, if you want to put it that way. Purifies himself. Um, that's, that's the term that's, that's going to be used here in verse 3. That, that we're becoming what we should be in him. And we're going to continue to mature. Uh, and this is that process. In the present time, we're doing it right now, but it's also going to be in heaven. Um, it says here uh, in verse 2, and it has not yet appeared what we will be. Have you ever thought of that? We got some little guy, little guy right here in the front row. We don't know what he's going to look like, act like, when he gets to be 21, 42, uh, 75. You just don't know. Okay, but we know all the potential of human life is in him to grow and, and to mature. Same with you, same with me. All the potential of what God has uh, for us is going to grow as we allow him to have full sway and we understand that his intentions are only but good because he loves us. And then there will be that day when we will be like him because we see him just as he is. There is that day, whether it comes through the rapture when the church is caught up and away going to heaven or when, it's, uh, when we pass away and where we meet him face to face, we're going to be like him. Our bodies are going to be radically changed, but not just that. It's going to be everything about us is going to be purified, and we're going to be like Christ. We're not going to be Christ. We're not going to be little gods, but we are going to be like Christ in the fullness of what he has been wanting to bring out in our lives. Can you rejoice in that? I sure can. I need it. Man, it's something to look forward to. <clears throat> And we will be like him. Romans 8, 29, first part of that verse. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. To become conformed, to look like him. What a hope. What an expectation we have. And our third major point is God's love causes his children not just to change, but to choose to change. See, the second point was that God changes his children because of his love. God does that, but then he puts it in us to choose to change. And so there's a part that falls upon us. Look at verse 3 here. And everyone who has this hope fixed, uh, fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. <clears throat> this is a great verse. It's a, we see here a precise hope. It's very precise. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him. Now, the New, New American Standard adds that word fixed so that we just kind of come to understand a clearer idea. But it's having our eyes set on him, on Jesus, considering his love, considering God's love, how that impacts us, and we have our focus, our mindset on him, it's going to change the way we act and where our priorities are. What's interesting here is we look at this word, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him. Oh, we have that whole concept of hope uh, all messed up, you know? Oh, I hope my team wins this year. Mm. I hope the store's not closed and they have that, that, that shirt in there that I wanted to get. 
Uh, you know, I, I hope they haven't run out of enchiladas down at the Mexican store. Uh, we can hope a lot of things. You know, that's just hope. That's just a wish. This kind of hope right here is an earnest expectation based on the revealed and experienced character of God. I'm going to say that again. This kind of hope that, that we're talking about in John is a hope that's an earnest expectation based on the revealed and the experienced character of God. On the revealed, that's through his word. God has revealed who he is. But we also go through the day-to-day -day experience and say, yeah, he's revealed this, and I've seen it in my life that I can count on God to do what he says he's going to do every moment of the day, even though the circumstances look very different in my life. I can count on God because of how he's been revealed and how I've experienced him. And so everyone who has this hope, this hope is that we will see him face to face. And as we keep that in front of our eyes, yes, indeed, and the days are getting close. Can you testify with me? Can I get an amen? amen. I never get to do that. <laughs> Can I get an amen? All right. Um, I just, I... Uh, I just sidetracked myself. Um, <clears throat> purifies himself. We will see him face to face. And we have that hope in him. And it is a precise hope. That hope that we will be with Jesus in person. This isn't going to be a Zoom meeting or remote, uh, you know, anything. This is face to face. And it's Jesus He's the object of our faith. Uh, we have our eyes, our hope, fixed on him. It's not fixed on, oh, I'd like it to be this way, and I'd like it, my God wouldn't do that. No, it's fixed on Jesus. Jesus as he is revealed. Ultimately, our hope is not in heaven or in our own glory in heaven. Our hope is in him. And we should never set our hope on anything that is other than that. Talking about our IRAs, our retirement accounts. Talking about our country. Talking about the systems, our, our economic system. Our hope shouldn't be in anything other than Jesus. Because this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Somewhere beyond the blue. All right. So <clears throat> that's the problem you get when you got a worship leader who's preaching. <laughs> they come up with all kinds of songs. Um, our only real hope is in Jesus Christ. And it's a personal hope. It's a personal hope because it says right here, if we have this hope... He purifies himself. We will purify ourselves. This is part of what we get to do in conjunction with what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives. That we purify ourselves. And this is a furthering the sanctification process. Um, and so, so what is it we're purifying? Well, let's look at this. And how are we doing it? It says we're going to purify himself, ourselves just as... He is pure. So as we're looking at Jesus and we're understanding who he is, we're going to purify ourselves in just the same way. I think that's one of the reasons why there's four Gospels. So we can look at who Jesus is from four different perspectives and how he interacted with people, how he interacted with the Pharisees, how he interacted with the Word of God, how he uh, resisted temptation. So we can see all of that and say, that's not me. Uh, I, didn't, I don't respond that way. When my wife said that to me the other day, I sure didn't respond like Jesus was or did uh, or would. And... So we purify ourselves. We say, Lord, this is not what I am designed to be. Your DNA in me 
your spiritual DNA means that I'm going to live very differently, that I'm going to learn to forgive, that I'm going to learn to uh, walk in purity in my mind. When I see somebody walking down the street, some cute girl, some cute guy, whatever, um, I, my thoughts are going to be narrow and focused. Uh, when I see this garbage coming on TV, I turn it off because I don't want that pollution to be going through my head. Oh, Lord, purify your people. It's a purifying hope. Uh, I want to turn your, uh, it was purifying hope. That's the last one. Um, turn your attention to uh, Titus chapter 2. This is verses 11 through 14. And um, this parallels all that we've said today. And Paul's writing it, so a completely different author, which shows you that the Spirit of God is working here, you know, using two different authors, two different times. Paul's writing this probably 30 years bef uh, before John ever writes this. But it's the same theme. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. I believe that's what God wants to do with us here at Calvary Crossroads. He wants us to be filled with wonder and awe of his love for us. He wants to change us, conforming us into his image, and also to bring us to where we're purifying ourselves. We're realizing the pollution that might be in our life, the way we're thinking, and lay it before him and have him eradicate that. Changing the way we're thinking. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world. Uh, don't, uh, alternate translation, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, into its way of thinking. When we start doing that, you know what's going to happen? We are going to be effective tools in the hands of our great God. We have, for a long time, been concerned with uh, speaking out, with the idea of um, we have an older congregation, we need more life in here, new people, um, things like that. You, you know what it really comes down to? We don't need any more programs. We don't need any more strategies in how to reach the unchurched. We need a room full of people who are passionate about Jesus Christ. Because when we're passionate, when we have filled our gaze and our vision with the love of God and who he is and what he's done with that, it radically changes us. And then we can't help but to go out in the community, go to the grocery store, buy our stuff, and we're reeking of the fragrance of Christ. And so, you know how it is you, you, when you go by somebody who's just put on this whole cologne and it's just, whoa. <clears throat> That's what we need to be in reference to Christ. That we just reek of him. And maybe reeking's not the term to use for God Almighty. But we are just overwhelming in our fragrance of Christ. <coughs> so as we finish this up, we've looked at God's love that we should continually be uh, contemplating it. That God's love changes his children and God's love causes his children to choose to change. There's a question that needs to come up right now. Are you... His child. 
Now, many of us are. Not all of us are. In a room this size, yeah, there's probably a few. Either you've been playing church, or you just are curious and you're here. You could be a young five-year-old in this room, an 80, 95-year-old in this room. The question is, have you received the Lord? Have you given your heart to the Lord said, Lord, I don't know all this means, but I got to have this. I got to have you because I know what my life has been like. And the sin that's in here, the, this, the gunk that I got in my heart, my mind, I can't get rid of. And the only thing that is going to do that is you. So, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Make me your child and help me to walk in the way that you have me to walk. It really is a simple first step, but it's a lifelong walk. And you have that choice. And you can do it right here in your seat. You can come up and talk to Ben and Marissa after the service. Uh, that is something I encourage you to do. And ain't nobody going to make you do it. You've got to choose. You definitely have to choose yourself. But then there's also those of us who have been walking with the Lord. We have made him uh, our father. And we've let gunk get up in our, <laughs> in our grill. You know, we, 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 we've been going down the highway of life and we got Bugs all over the windshield of our car. How do we get that away? How do, how, windshield wipers, man, I, I, my best efforts, just smear it around. No. We come to the Lord. We identify what the issue is. Lord, reveal it to me. And 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will wipe that clean so that you don't have a messy windshield in the car of your life and you can see straight through it to where we're going. We're going to sing a song that Diana is going and the team is going to introduce uh, that's been around for a little while called, Oh, Come to the Altar. And it is an invitation song. Oh, Come to the Altar. And it deals with a decision we need to make. And this is for all of us. There is stuff that the Holy Spirit is bringing up into your heart and your life, whether it's you need to become a Christian Become, give your heart to the Lord, or whether you need to deal with some gunk, spiritual gunk that is in your life that you need to leave behind, repent, and walk toward the Lord. So this song, as the, the worship team is singing this, sing it to the Lord, because it is an invitation song, but it's for you. It's for me. And then... As the Lord is dealing with you, I'm just going to ask Ben to come up front here close by. And, and even during the song, if you want to come up and you want to uh, pray, pray with Ben about this, please do. The invitation is there. God has nothing but good for each one of us. But if we hold on to the gunk, we've just limited what he wants to do. Let's pray together. Father God, we are thoroughly uh, blown away by your goodness. As we've seen your great love extended to us, that God demonstrated his own love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, you have reached out. You have be, uh, been the initiator in love. Oh, we can only respond back, Lord. And, and as we do, Lord, you call us to enter this relationship with you, to become your children. We ask you, Lord, to teach us what that means.
We ask you, Lord, to, to soften our hearts. Father, if we have gunk that needs to be dealt with, Lord, we want to repent. We want to turn 180 degrees and go the opposite direction. We want to follow hard after you. We want to purify ourselves because we have that hope that we are going to see you face to face. And so we ask, Lord, that you would challenge us. Put your spotlight on us. That we may walk in holiness of the truth. In Jesus' name, amen.